A lot of buyers can't get over even small things like paint, a hole in the floor, floors being uneven, scares them to death. And so those scenarios, if you're savvy and you understand and have gone underneath and looked at it and feel like that's going to be a good investment, you can oftentimes get the deal, which that's key. If you're a residential real estate agent earning $200,000 a year and you want to grow your passive income, this show's for you. Learn the secrets other agents use and hear from experts in our field in order to guide you along your journey to investing in assets like apartment communities so that you can turn your commissions into cash flow. I'm Randall DeCleared. Let's go, baby. All right, welcome back. It's great to have you here today. Always love our conversations. And today we have a good one with Lisa Best. She is a home warranty rep and specialist with Armadillo. And as real estate professionals, as investors, we're always, not always, but maybe you should be including home warranties as part of your sales whenever you're selling them or whenever you have rental properties and that sort of thing. So Lisa and I discuss that. We dive into it, kind of look at what Armadillo has to offer compared to some other home warranty companies, how they've changed some of the strategies that they've employed. So have a listen on that front, pretty unique sort of program that they've got. And then we just take the conversation, kind of meander around, talk about investing because she's been in real estate for a long time. She's got her license. She did some new home sales back in the 90s and she's been rehabbing some houses. So a lot of information and she's seen a lot. So it's good to have a conversation, just kind of see where she is now and then where she's going. So I ask her at the end, like what she's working on now and how she's looking for a certain type of house or uh, investment and why she's looking for it and what's stopping her from doing it. So it's a good conversation on that front. If you are looking to invest yourself, kind of how I work through with her quickly, like, okay, what are you working on? What are you doing? Da, 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 and just kind of go down the line in order to execute on the plan that somebody has in their mind and getting it out into actual action. So again, thanks for joining today. If you're getting value out of the show, please go on rate and review. Helps us out a lot. And without further ado, let's jump in and talk to Lisa. Here we go. We're proud to be sponsored by Ridgeline Investment Group. Ridgeline has a track record of transacting more than 53 million in assets throughout Texas. Ridgeline is currently looking to acquire 100 to 200 unit Class B multifamily communities between 5 and 20 million in San Antonio, Temple, Waco, Tyler, and other Texas secondary markets. To learn more about Ridgeline Investment Group, visit www.ridgelineig.com. Well, let's jump back high level, kind of tell us who you are and what you're working on right now. Like, I also want to hear from you and kind of get where you are located and kind of how you made an evolution from the brokerage world into what you're currently working on. Okay. I'm Lisa Best, and I currently work for Armadillo Home Warranty, which is a startup home warranty company. Came into the industry because they saw that there were some cumbersome pain points to traditional home warranty. Traditional home warranty is meant to be a great cost mitigator. So when you're talking wealth and trying to make money, it's the great cost mitigator, but traditional home warranty also has some difficulties because they have exclusions and that's tough. So Armadillo came in and said, we can fix that. They came in with 80% less exclusions than traditional home warranty. So right off the bat, it's going to save more money. And in terms of reimbursing, letting you use your own contractor, another huge advantage. And when you use your own contractor, A lot of times with larger companies, the process to reimburse you takes forever. So with Armadillo, their process is Venmo, PayPal, or check. And they do that really quickly. So it's a great investment tool. It's a great cost mitigator. I got into it because my joy is to work with realtors. My background is real estate. I got my license 30 years ago, began in new home sales in the Triangle, North Carolina area, which is Raleigh-Durham. And worked in new homes for almost eight years and then went into general brokerage. And from there, went into deep dive housing data with a company called Metro Study, which is great. And then from there into home warranty with American Home Shield, 210, and now Armadillo. All right. Deep dive. All right. I want to know what the heck that was. Deep dive uh, (laughs) data, something like that is what you said. Yeah. All right. We'll talk about that. But let's go back and talk a little bit about the actual home warranty deal. I'm always curious. And that's why I want to bring you on because we're as an investor and as a broker as well, you know, the question always comes up like, are you going to do a home warranty? Like, is it worth it? What is this thing actually going to do? And you spoke to one of the pain points, which is like, is this thing actually worth it? Because 
is it going to cover what I want it to cover? Exactly. And what I have found in my experience is a lot of times it says it's covered and then you get the contractor that comes out from the home warranty company and they're obviously trying to reduce costs as much as possible. That's really their, what is it called? Their mandate. Yeah. They're operating. Yeah. And so then they end up like, you definitely need a new water heater and like any other contractor would tell you that, but they're like, I'm going to go, you know, put a bandaid on this thing and see how long this thing's going to last. So anyway, I'm kind of curious. One thing I love is that you can use your own contractor so you can get an outside perspective on what actually needs to happen. So just maybe speak to the exclusions that typical home warranty companies have. You said that you guys have got rid of 80% of them. So like, what did you guys add in? What is it actually included now? Yeah, we have a very, very small contract now. Our exclusions are very minimal. So with a typical home warranty, we'll give a scenario. You pay $700 for the year. And you've got your systems, which is considered HVAC, plumbing, electrical, water heater, and then appliances covered for the year. And that typically means repair and or replacement up to a certain dollar amount. So let's say it's $3,000 per system or $3,000 per appliance. So a typical warranty may say we cover the refrigerator up to $3,000, which that's significant. But when you get in there, they may say, except the ice maker, we don't cover that or we don't cover that particular part or piece, or we don't cover the drawers, the shelving. You know, we just cover the actual- The box. Yeah. And that's disconcerting because as we all know, the ice maker is always the first to go in the refrigerator. So things like that, we do cover those. Okay. And so it makes it just a much more cost-effective tool for sure. And then when you're talking about using your own contractor, that's a significant advantage because like you said- when you have to use a home warranties contractor, those are pre-negotiated rates. So the incentive for a company to come out to a warranty client versus a retail client, you can tell that's going to be minimal. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, Those people are going to be the least and the last to get serviced. So oftentimes that's why you see there's a longer wait for someone to get to you. When I sold traditional home warranty, I would tell people... It's not an emergency service. So if the water heater blows and water's gushing out, call someone right away. Don't go through the warranty because I couldn't guarantee that someone could get there. But with Armadillo, being able to use your own contractor, it is for an emergency. Call somebody, you know, go through your warranty and call someone. Yeah, It just makes it a much more expedited and beneficial tool. So in that scenario, water heater blows midnight. You get a 24-hour plumbing service out there. They come, they replace it. What guarantee do I have as a consumer that that thing is actually going to be covered? Because it's already been ripped out of the wall. Like, you know, how do you guys know that it wasn't just tampered with because you didn't send a guy out or something like that? I don't know. Is it just like, no questions asked? Okay, this guy is a licensed plumber and he's on our approved vendor list or something? Or what does that even look like? The way they do that is they give you up to a dollar amount that you can just automatically do. Oh, okay. So let's say it's $400. They can come out and they can do anything up to $400. If it's going to be more than that, they foresee that it's going to have to be replaced. Then what they typically do is they have to call an authorization line, which for traditional home warranty can take forever. With our company, they man it. So someone's there to answer the phone and they just have to get authorization to go ahead and replace the system. Got it. So the customer or the buyer, the owner of the house, whatever knows whatever that limit is per item and going into it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Are you still flipping houses? Still doing that? I just did one last year, end of last year. Mm -hmm. End of last year. Okay. So are you using your own service? Are you offering home warranties? Like, how do you guys do that? Oh, when we flip? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I always put one on there. (laughs) Yeah. Definitely. I think it's so advantageous for one, for our peace of mind, because no buyer with a heart wants to think that they're letting their home or no seller, excuse me, wants to think that someone's going to take over their home and have an issue. You really don't. Yeah. You don't want that for them and you definitely don't want it to come back to you. So from a liability standpoint, it's good just to have that to say, hey, over and above, we're leaving this in good shape for you, but also we've got some kind of insurance for you down the road, at least for the first year. Yeah. And then they can renew that, you know, yearly, take it on themselves if they want to. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's one of the things on, because I'm a broker as well, when I list my you know, insurance company wants me, they're like, you're not covered unless you give a home warranty. Like you have to at least offer it. If they don't want it, great. So we have to offer it every time. And we always 
do one on a flip. It makes the most sense to do. It does. Okay. Let's see where we can take this because we can talk investing. We can talk home warranties. We can talk just general real estate and that sort of thing. Obviously, the point of the show is helping real estate agents and professionals get into the investing game if they're not already in it. We talk a lot about you know syndications and funds, and those are some of the things that I'm working on now, getting into the bigger deals. But I love talking about even just bread and butter, single family houses, fix and flip, anything that you are like well versed in is worth having the conversation around so that experiences that you have, you can share with people so they can get a leg up. So I'm curious, if you think back, you started in the new home sales, what was it that really gave you the courage and the encouragement, I guess, to go and actually buy one? What was the first, you know, like, were you afraid of it? Was it a, uh, you know, let's just rock and roll, let's do it? It really wasn't. I think that it all depends on, you know, what market you're in. You have to be savvy enough to understand the trends in your market and how quickly things are selling and or not. One nice thing about the Raleigh-Durham market, and you probably have seen it on the top 10 places to live over the past, you know, 20 years. One thing about our market is we are insulated from typical national trends. So like you mentioned, 2008 earlier, 2007, 2008, definitely a downturn, definitely a difficult market. But in this market, we don't experience those high up and downs like a Florida or a California did, or those great amount of foreclosures. We stay pretty steady. We have the universities that give us a great base of workers. We have Research Triangle Park that creates just a great base for business activity and economic activity. So we just don't tend to have those swings. So for me, as an investor, it makes sense in this market. Very little scares me here because there's an influx of people all the time. Yeah, it's similar to San Antonio. Like we don't have the highs and lows. We certainly, like when I started buying, this is what I was saying. When I started buying, it was 2009 when I bought the first one. And it was just a very depressed market. And I didn't realize it was one of those lucky time to enter the market. And I was buying houses for, I think the first one was 10,000 actually, $10,000 the first house. Oh, isn't that crazy to think about? And then, yeah, I started buying $20,000 houses in just chunks. And so, yeah, knowing your market is one thing, but also just getting out and actually doing it and just buying something. You really don't know what you don't know until you're active and doing it. And then you learn as you go, you iterate and you make sure that you're just constantly trying, 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 right? So I guess let's talk about how you are structured now. You're rehabbing houses. Kind of tell me what it is that you're looking for. What does your buy box look like? And how often are you buying these things so that you're using your son for swinging hammers? And so you got some labor there. (laughs) He would like to work himself out of a job too. I still like a single family home and I'm still looking for something that can be, like we said, not can be rehabbed. It's structurally sound. The bones are good, has cosmetic issues and or I find that a lot of buyers can't get over even small things like paint, a hole in the floor, floors being uneven, scares them to death. And so those scenarios, if you're savvy and you understand and have gone underneath and looked at it and feel like that's going to be a good investment, you can oftentimes get the deal, which that's key. I still like single family homes. I still like them at a lower cost average than you see going in the market. I'm finding that in the Raleigh-Durham market, you have to go a little further out now than you used to, for sure. Our triangle area has expanded out further. So I'm thinking now 20, 25 minutes outside of that market is where you're finding the bread and butter now. Yeah. But it's also expanding out to those areas. So I feel like you're also getting in a good time. Yeah, that's kind of similar. I started buying outside of San Antonio a while back. We have a similar triangle, San Antonio to Bernie, to Braunfels and Seguin. And so I started buying stuff all in that range. Yes. And recently we just started looking at buying land and putting mobile homes on those properties just because it's, again, my whole thing is get rid of the contractors and get rid of the long time frame it can take to rehab a property because of contractors like, oh man, I'm going to go find another job while I'm working on your job. I need another down payment. So, you know, it's like, so since you have rehabbed some houses, let's talk some war stories then. Tell me the maybe one of the worst things that's happened to one of your rehabs or to a project or on a project or probably is, you know, stolen property. It's the worst. Yeah. You know. So what happened? We had materials taken from the job site, flooring. One time we had, you know, they were taking copper out of your HVAC system. <laughs> I mean, had that. 
So how would you, again, someone listening has never rehabbed a house. What did you do to mitigate that going forward? Like, how did you stop that from happening? Always storing them where you can lock it. <laughs> that's a key. I mean, that sounds common sense, but that's not always the case because you're not always the one in the house. Mm -hmm. There's workers in the house, there's contractors doing work. So making sure that you're going to have to be present. You're going to have to make sure that you're the one locking it up. You can't really always trust. So were you locking it in the house or were you getting like a Connex box and you were just putting it off to the side and you're dropping your like materials box? Yeah, both. Yeah. Okay. Because that's what I would recommend. One thing that I did and anyone listening, this is a hack when you have a house that doesn't have power or if the house, you don't want to set up Wi-Fi for that house. You go, you get some game cameras and the game cameras you can set up all over, you know, like inside and outside. There's a system that you can have it text you when there's movement in the house or motion. And when motion comes, it'll take a picture of it and it'll text it to your phone. So I caught plenty of people breaking into properties. Um, and I remember one time I went to a house. I called the police. I'm on the way down there. We had just started rehabbing this place. We had a bunch of materials in there. And I'm on my way. And when I got there, the police had just gotten there and they went in the house and the guy had a knife on him, like sleeping on the floor with a knife on him. And I was like, what the hell would I have done if that was me that went through that door first, you know? So anyway, yeah, just, you know, if you're rehabbing a house, I have all kinds of stories like that. But yeah, the game camera system is pretty solid. You set these things up again and you can just have pictures taken and sent to your phone so you know who's in the house. You can give those to the police, um, all of that good stuff. We went to more of a, um, like an open door. I don't know if you ever toured any of their properties when they listed those things, yeah. but they always had this tiny little Wi-Fi system set up in the house. And so we kind of set that thing up and now all of the houses that we have have actual live cameras. And so I can log in, kind of see it, see what's going on. I like it. Yeah. So a couple of tips there. I mean, again, I can talk rehab stories. I can talk these things all day. I think because you are now focused on home warranties, let's really focus back on the home warranty side of things sure. and kind of figure out how um, a home warranty can best help realtors and best help investors on their deal. So let's start with the realtors first. Like what's the rationale, I guess, for a realtor? Like, is there a kickback system? You know, a lot of these times on deals, there's a fee that the realtor is getting for promoting a certain provider. So like, what's the most amount of money you see agents making on these things? Is it just nickels and dimes or are they actually making a substantial amount over time if they're high volume? Well, with Armadillo, they took a little different track on that because of RESPA, of course, what we decided to do is we give realtors an 8% discount on any of the warranties anytime they use them. So we think that's just more significant is having the discount. Okay. And it's not just for them and their own properties. If they want to buy one for an investor they're working with or buyer seller, whatever, they can purchase that and still get the discount, which we thought was more significant really than giving them something back. And also in North Carolina, you have to disclose that. So it's uncomfortable. So we thought the discount is the way to go. Okay. And also um, here for Armadillo, we cover a listing. Let's say you have an investor and you help them purchase the property and they're going to use you to list it again. We will cover if that seller is going to offer the buyer a warranty, we'll cover that listing while it's listed for up to $1,500. That's just included. Okay. The buyer gets the home and they take it from that point on for a year. You know, there's, the seller's warranty is separate from the buyer's, but it's there for the life of the listing. And so that's a very significant way to help your your seller to save money. You can be the hero is, as long as it goes on when it's listed and it's not after the home inspection. It has to be put on when it's listed. Put on when it's listed. So it's a fee that's charged. It's not like you're doing it for the realtor because they're your client. Still, there's a charge associated with it. There's no... The only charge is if they make a service call. The service calls a hundred dollars, but the fifty hundred dollar coverage goes on there. It's just a benefit of being able to have the buyers have the coverage for a year. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. So I'm gonna go list one, two, three Main Street and I, I call you and say, Hey, okay, I've got a new listing. Go ahead and activate that seller's policy. Yes. What are you charging me? Nothing at that point. It's essentially I just have to include I'm guaranteeing that I'm gonna pay for a warranty once it closes. Correct. What if it doesn't sell? That does happen occasionally and there's no charge unless there was a service 
Okay. So up to 1500 bucks. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. So again, with the investors, if I'm buying a property and I've got a rental property and I've got a policy, like what kind of coverage do you guys have? Pools, coverages? Do you have everything that would be necessary for like an Airbnb, all of that? We do. We start at in the 400 range and that's still systems and a few appliances. And then we go all the way up to a premium plan, which is your everything, your bells and whistles, your garbage compactor, your things like that. And then you can have extras like whole house generator, pool spa, a well and septic, which is huge, extra freezer, wine cooler. Yeah, that's good. Over manufactured homes, you were just talking about putting manufactured homes on land. Mm-hmm. Those were the home warranty and they often have well and septic. So that's big. Yep. Well, what would you say your best piece of advice would be for real estate agents looking to invest, looking to put some money to work? You've done a number of things. You've been rehabbing some houses. I would say take a risk. I mean, I think people shy away from it. They look at things like interest rates and they get you know, fearful and they say, well, I don't have all the money I need to invest. Like, There's so many creative ways to invest. Like get to know, get to know your real estate community, get to all your mortgage lenders, get to know all those people that can be great resources to you. There's ways to make it happen, but just make it happen. Take a risk. Don't be so gun shy. Don't listen to the naysayers. I mean, you have to take the plunge at some point. So do it. Would you say there's a like lowest barrier to entry point? Like if you say, just go do it. Like, what does that even mean? Obviously, there's a thousand different ways you can invest in real estate. There really are. I mean, just go out there. I would go outside a little bit of the triangle area and find a tiny home, maybe a tiny home, like a literal tiny home, maybe a manufactured home on a piece of land. I mean, start, get there. I think so many people see seven, eight percent now and they it scares them to death. Well, I was selling in the 1990s and that's what we had. Yeah. Seven, eight, nine percent. My parents bought it 13, 14%. You know, I mean, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. It's all temporary. It's never going to be this forever. So, yeah. I remember having those conversations with my parents too. It's like, this is nothing. Yeah, exactly. So, what else are you working on right now? Just looking for some investments. I'm actually wanting a duplex now yeah. on the outskirts. They're hard to find in the country, but that's what I'm looking at. Yeah. And what's the rationale there? Um. Well, I have a 22 year old. Who needs to go ahead and invest as well? So that's the thought process. Get him in the process. He lives in one part and then we rent out the other. Yeah, that's a great idea. House hacking 101, buy something, live in it. I mean, I heard something the other day and, and it's that is not for everybody, but it is absolutely a really good strategy because you can go get an FHA loan or you can get like up to four units and get an FHA loan on. And if you have the ability to live in one, you will be living for free. Essentially, you're going to be growing your appreciation over time and you'll reduce your expense by reducing your mortgage to zero. Hopefully, maybe you're making a little bit of money. And so, yeah, if you look at something like that and you have the ability or the desire, a lot of people, when you get a little bit older, you're like, I want my own space. That ain't going to happen. I'm not going to do that. (laughs) And so it's not for everybody, but yeah, absolutely. If you can do it, do it. Yeah. And I don't know what rates are like. I'm sure rentals in San Antonio are high. I mean, here, the average rental is $1,800. Yeah. Astronomical. It doesn't make any sense to rent. Yeah. I mean, for apartments, it's one thing. You can still get 1100 bucks, or you can get $800 depending on where you are. But for housing, yeah, it's increased. I think dollar forty something like that a foot. So if you're living in a decent sized property, then it's not inexpensive. Not at all. Yeah. So, okay. So you're working on that. What's stopping you from buying one? Finding one. <laughs> how are you looking? I'm going to work through a little scenario with you here. Oh, that'd be great if you could help me with that. Yeah. How many are you looking at per day? Not very many. I mean, probably four or five at the most. So you have that many to look at. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that's a decent number. So is the price too high to make it make sense or what is? It's been a combination of that and just the quality of the actual duplex itself. Okay. So no new construction, no new builds, anything like that that you've seen. Have you looked at maybe building one? Are you at that point or would you guys ever consider doing that? I would consider doing that. Yeah, because I mean, then you're you're getting a brand new product. It just depends on timeline and how much time you have. If you get fully entitled dirt, you know what I'm talking about when I say that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's got utilities, everything's ready, everything's there. It's already permitted or not permitted, but it's it's got, you know, platted and and zoned properly. Yeah. And then all you have to do is build because what I have found recently is that labor 
for the things that I've been looking at, you know, these development deals, uh, is coming down a little bit. I found a few builders who can build at reasonable prices. And so my basis in a deal would be significantly lower than if I were to go out and buy it new. And then you have the experience and it sounds like your son has the, you know, ability to manage a project, uh, go out, hire all the trades, do the work, and then you could be in the deal for 70% of full retail value. Mm-hmm. And that spread is yours rather than someone else's. Again, not for everybody, takes a lot, but if you have the time and the energy and the ability, then that's definitely something that I would look at doing. Um, again, that or you could start putting out feelers for a bunch of wholesalers, you know, like, hey, I'm looking for a duplex, get on every single Facebook board that you possibly can. Yes. Drop your email and be like, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm looking for. This is my exact buy box. I want a duplex that is this vintage, da, 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 all everything you have in there. And then really that's it. But I always ask because I'm curious, like if you have that goal and you know that's what you're working on, then how many you're actually seeing, how many you're actually touring and how many offers have you made? Because that's really what it comes down to. It really is. Yeah. And I don't know how things are moving over there. In San Antonio, it slowed a little bit. And I mean, we're still getting tours, we're still getting offers, we're still getting things coming through, but it's definitely slowed down. One, it's the end of like the summer buying season. And so we're getting into you know school year and that sort of thing. But like really, if you're not making the offers, that's really what it comes down to. So like, again, how many offers have you made on those things? Oh, that's what it was. If it's slowing down and sellers are still high, have you put in low ball offers just to see, right? Yes, for sure. Yes. I'm always going to do that. Yeah. People are like, don't do that. It's going to hurt their... I don't know. As a realtor, I'd rather have an offer. So... Yeah. It's just one, it's kind of a starting point, but it's also like, hey, this is what I can pay for. I'm not trying to offend you. Yeah. If it makes sense, great. We can do the deal. If it doesn't make sense, no problem. Things change in the future. Just give me a heads up and let me know and I'll revisit it at that time. Yeah. If we still have the capital to deploy, then... Maybe it'll work if you guys come down on your price, but I can't guarantee anything. Exactly. That like verbatim, if you guys say that to a lot of other brokers or agents or home sellers or that sort of thing, I mean, that is really the pitch and the sales pitch to get deals done. So yes, I appreciate that. I mean, as a realtor myself, I appreciate the honesty. Yeah, for sure. So anything else you want to cover before we jump off? No, this has been great. I really do appreciate the opportunity. It's been good. I've learned some things too. I've got some new tools in my pocket as well. Good catching up. If you guys want to catch up with Lisa, her contact information is in the show notes. You can email her or call her. And we really appreciate you coming on, sharing your knowledge today and telling us all about yourself and what you're working on. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. All right. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Surprisingly, most of the agents we speak with got into real estate hoping to gain passive income and become work optional. However, only one in five ever start investing. Most are simply too afraid to start. Once you get educated by listening to this show, you'll be able to overcome that fear and become the one in five who are finding financial freedom. Don't miss a single episode. If you want to stay up to date, the best way is to make sure you're subscribed. So if you haven't done that, go ahead and do it now. And we'll catch you on the next episode.